from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Library of Congress and the Whittall Pavilion, which was uh, constructed under the patronage of Mrs. Gertrude Clark Whittall, who uh, quite famously donated the wonderful Stradivarius collection to the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is Nicholas Brown. I'm a music specialist here and concert producer. And it is uh, my great pleasure this evening to introduce to you Gabriel Cahane and Timothy Andres, who are seated right here with me. I just want to give you a slight overview of their bios before we start chatting. Uh, Gabriel is a songwriter, singer, pianist, composer, devoted amateur cook, guitarist, and even an occasional banjo player. Um, this year he made his recital debut at Carnegie's Zankel Hall in New York um, in a program devoted entirely to his music. Uh, he's been commissioned by the likes of Carnegie Hall, the Los Angeles, uh, Los, excuse me, Los Angeles Philharmonic, American Composers Orchestra, the Kronos Quartet, the Caramore Festival, and the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Um, he's currently working um, on performances of a new song cycle, which is based on the Works Progress Administration. And for those of you that don't know, the Library of Congress holds the collections for the Federal Theater Project, Federal Music Project, Negro Theater Project, all these, these great things that came out of the Works Progress Administration. If only we had that type of employment for artists these days. Um, Gabriel has uh, had the pleasure of working with artists such as Sufjan Stevens, Rufus Wainwright, Chris Thiel, Brad Meldow, Jeremy Dank, Elisa Weilerstein, and um, the legendary John Adams. Uh, his, uh, Quincy? <laughs> Which one of the three who are interesting? Um, he, his original uh, musical, February House, was uh, premiered at the New York Public Theater in May 2012 and was recently released on the Story Sound label. And uh, Timothy, who's seated right here to my right, is a composer and pianist. He's a native of Connecticut and lives in Brooklyn, as does uh, Gabriel. Uh, besides the musical interests in his life, he's uh, very focused on uh, things having to do with the natural world, graphic arts, technology, cooking, and photography. And he has a fondness for animals and creatures, I have heard, as well, besides the cooking. Who history. told you that? <laughs> a certain uh, colleague of mine from Tennessee who is to remain nameless. Uh, <laughs> Timothy has uh, performed for Lincoln Center's Great Performances, San Francisco Performances, um, Bard, and uh, also with the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra this season also San Francisco performances, and some of the, the top uh, new music and contemporary music ensembles that have performed his music include the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, which is of course led by uh, Gabriel's father, Jeffrey, who was here at the library in <laughs> October performing, which is very exciting. Um, Le Poisson Rouge, which is sort of the, the hippest late night venue happening in New York City at the moment, and uh, Eighth Blackbird, which was recently in DC, and the Crash Ensemble. Um, very exciting to share with you is uh, the fact that the Library of Congress has commissioned uh, Timothy for uh, a string quartet, which will be premiered here in the Coolidge Auditorium on May 22nd by the Ataka Quartet, and that event is part of our John Adams residency from May 22nd to May 25th. So starting on Wednesday at 10 a.m., Wednesday the 10th, you can get tickets for that. So all of you in this room, don't need to call me before then, you can just <laughs> go online on Wednesday. Great. <laughs> and without further ado, we're going to get them to talk because I'm boring. Um, so what can you tell us about your working relationship? When did it begin? Um, what creative energies do you get off of each other in terms of uh, you know, the projects that you work on and the performances and the compositions and such? Well, we, um, I've known Gabe since about uh, summer of 2010, I want to say, um, and he he asked me to send him some, some scores of my music because he was uh, curating something or something or other. Oh, yeah. Um, is that better? Yeah. A little bit of, cut that a little frequency. Feedback. A little bit of feedback there. What note is that, Timo? It's like an F. <laughs> Just below. <laughs> cut below 440. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we quickly discovered that we, sh we shared certain musical affinities and, and certain culinary 
affinities. Um, it, I would note that we've spent <clears throat> quite a bit more time cooking together than we have playing music together. <laughs> we've probably at least formally. That's yeah, true. We've, we've collaborated on a, I would say probably a dozen dinners, and this is only our third concert together. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what kinds? You of, can see where our priorities lie. Yeah. What kinds of foods do you guys enjoy cooking together? <laughs> is it kind of a? a it seems to be a running pasta theme. Yeah. Um, we're fr frustrated Jews who wish we were Italian, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that must be. That's funny. Um, and what can you tell us about the concerts where you have collaborated on in, in performance? What, what have been the natures of the, the programs and venues? I, one thing that I've observed is that Timo and I are, are approaching a common point from opposite directions, which is to say that uh, Timo is someone steeped in the classical tradition and, and the tradition of new concert music but whose compositions I think very frequently have, have an element of um, almost pop art to them as, as dense <laughs> and, as dense and um, nuanced as they become. There's, there's very often a kernel of something coming out of popular music. And I'm not sure, sure where that comes from. Whereas I would say that I'm sort of coming from being a songwriter and taking classical elements into my work as a songwriter and and have eventually uh, ended up writing formal concert works, but mm -hmm. but I think we're we're sort of on this bridge, and we've somehow met in the middle. Well, I think I think um, that neither neither of us really has too much regard for sort of stylistic um, uh, labels. You you could say um, that um, we don't feel limited in sort of what we uh, take into our music by um, kind of what, what someone writing about that music would maybe call it. Um, so. so I think that the, the programs that we've done together have been sort of experiments in, in bridging these various gaps of you know, formal concert works, song, where, where do those two meet? Can we just um, do away with all of these distinctions and put together a melange of music that it satisfies us orally and spiritually and emotionally. Well, and yes, and I, I think we'd um, we'd we'd already sort of both a lot of the things that we're playing tonight. Um, we'd already kind of both discovered for ourselves um, independently. Independently, right? And uh, it's I don't know. It's it's something that. Um, I, th I think it, it almost makes more sense. Like, for instance, those Ives songs. Um, we're doing four, three or four Ives songs, and um, to me, it makes more. It makes l less sense to have like a trained, like operatic singer um, singing those in a in a really formal setting, and. Because they aren't really about that, you know, and I think yeah. the, the those Britain songs are the same way, and that um, it it really does does them a great service to um, kind of put them in a slightly less formal yeah. context. I think to to dovetail off of that that specific comment that Timo made, I think one of one of my preoccupations as a singer coming from um, a world in which I almost exclusively sing with a microphone is discovering that that there are ways to approach um, a way, ways to approach certain art song that up until the time of amplification was necessarily um, often rather emotive in order to fill a large space and you know I'll say apologize in advance that Coolidge has one of the most glorious acoustics that there is I think probably <laughs> in America um, and, and we were open to the possibility of doing this concert unamplified, but I think a lot of my technique as a singer has very much to do with, with using a microphone, so we are going to very lightly amplify those songs. But, but then to follow up on, on what Timo was saying about Ives and, and the Britain folk songs, I think it is, it's vernacular music that happens to be very complex uh, in, in yeah. the way that it's put together. And, and so exploring the notion of singing that music really like a folk singer and not like um, a, a trained uh, leader recitalist is, is, I think, part of the, the project of this program. I think it gets at the substance of the songs a little more 
there's kind of less to break through, at least for me. I mean, um, yeah. even even because even though I didn't, even though I did grow up sort of in the classical world, I've I've never um, I've never felt a huge affinity for the classical voice, and that's one reason I I haven't written a huge amount of vocal yeah. music. Um, so that that was definitely something that was interesting for me to discover. I think we're also we're entering an era in which because of the possibility of singing with a microphone versus not singing with a microphone, people are able to discover their natural um, gifts as singers to a greater extent. There are certain um, bel canto or you know, very trained um, leader singers or opera singers, I'm thinking of you know, Lorraine Hunt, Lieberson, Thomas Glastoff, Ian Bostridge, who, whose voices just feel so natural singing in that idiom with that kind of vibrato, that kind of breath yeah. support. But there are a lot of people who are trained where it feels like they're, they're putting on a costume when they sing that way. That also happens in theater. There are a lot of theater singers who are trying to emulate a certain sound. And I think what's really beautiful about this moment is that there are all these different ways that one can sing and fewer barriers to finding one's, uh, one's most expressive way of, of singing, I guess. It's true. You've got uh, you know, people like Tom Waits. Like, <laughs> that guy doesn't have a great voice. <laughs> All right, so here at the library this, this season, we're looking a lot at American song. So this program obviously fits into that. Um, we have this project called Songs of America. And for us, the idea of looking at song is to really think about and contemplate the, the way that it tells history and the way that it, it is an identification of, of peoples in a society, whether it's you know, Benjamin Britten's folk songs written when he wrote them in the 40s, or it's a contemporary performance tonight. Um, and even though Benjamin Britten is a British composer, he spent time in the United States, he had a relationship with the library, so his songs, while they're British folk songs, are part of American song literature. Um, and they're it, certainly songs that, like, I knew growing mm -hmm. up. And oh, a, number, yeah. a number of them were premiered in the States, mm -hmm. so. Um, so we what? claim them. Yes, definitely <laughs> we do. We're happy to claim Benjamin Britten here. And of course, uh, the, the Kusevitsky uh, Foundation had commissioned Peter Grimes, and we have the manuscript here, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so in, in this vein about talking about American song and, and what it says about society, and the, the selections that you've chosen for this evening, whether they be the Britain, the original works, or the, the Ives, and even the Schumanns, uh, the Schumann song as well, what message, if any, comes out of these songs for sort of contemporary life today for you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I don't think there's an agenda. Yeah, I no. think we were thinking more, more about certain technical things, key relations, mm -hmm. how the, the program is more curated. The, the centerpiece of the program is the, these miniatures, sort of like a tasting menu, um, a metaphor that I will probably use again in the concert. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I think that we were interested in pairing solo piano works with piano and voice works and having this kind of antiphonal um, conversation. Yeah, it's almost like, a, uh, like a, a game of free association a little bit. Exactly, yeah. So I think there's, there is no message other than this is all music that we love and we, we hope that we've <coughs> curated it in, in such a way that it, um, even in those things that are familiar, they will be recontextualized mm -hmm. and maybe right. offer something a little bit different. Right. Um, and I, I really appreciate that as a, as a concert goer myself. And I think something that we've been noticing here in DC with our, our programs of uh, sort of contemporary music, especially is that, and contemporary audience, audiences such as yourselves, is that we're approaching concert going from a perspective of wanting to experience things that we're familiar with in a new light or new things that we might not ever understand, but we're open to going and experiencing these these innovative ways of presenting things, and I think tonight's program right. really is exciting in that way. Well, I mean, um, we, we live in an age where we, we can always, our, our favorites are always instantly accessible. We can mm -hmm. go and listen to Dichter Liebe whenever we want. Um, and so the, the reason to go to a live event um, has to be more than just, you know, to, to hear that, because mm -hmm. we've got so many great, historical recordings. We don't even need any more. Um, it's, I, I mean, when I, when I go to a concert, I want to be sort of shown something, I guess. Not that, I, not that I, it needs to be didactic, but 
more, more sort of gently led mm. to my own conclusions, I would say. <laughs> I think another way, of, uh, another angle to this is that I, I grew up in, in the era of cassette mixtapes. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing... An iTunes shuffle, for that matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I started doing programs like this only a few years ago, it, it took me several months to realize that what I was doing was a version of a mixtape. And, and I think that thinking, thinking of it as you know, a gift that you give rather, rather than it being to a friend, to a bunch of strangers, <laughs> is, to a certain extent, what we're, what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that metaphor. <laughs> did you were cassette tapes done by the time you? Uh... I never made mixtapes. I did. I did make mixed CDs. Right. So. <laughs> I'm dating myself here. <laughs> <laughs> you were just much more advanced. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about the significance of uh, the Kurtag transcriptions at the Bach, which are used as bookends for the program tonight? I, well, I kind of see them as. Uh, like a lot of the music in on this program is somehow rooted in Bach, um, and it just seemed like a, a nice sort of ceremonial way of opening and closing the set. I mean, uh, I I know, for instance, Ives always like to start a day by playing through a prelude and fugue from the Well-Tempered Clavier. Um, I just did Brahms, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm sure. Uh, it's, it's a great way to start the day. <laughs> I've tried. It's, uh, it's fun. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there was a huge amount of logic beyond that. Also, they're just really cool and inventive transcriptions mm -hmm. by, by Kortog. And I think we were also interested in, um, in finding a way to, to do just a little bit of forehands. So mm -hmm. it's true, yeah. yeah. No, no great master plan. Well, I, yeah, I think it. This whole concert should have a sort of living room vibe, and um, actually, I, I'm remembering in our in our first concert together, we actually did have armchairs. We on requested the stage. in our in our tech writer that there be a rug, <laughs> lamps, and a, and a couple of armchairs. Yeah, we provided them. <laughs> so that when the other person was playing, we only tonight we had, we had two piano. pianos. The, then we had one piano, and we, the other person would go and sit in the armchair. <laughs> Work uh, on the Saturday New York Times crossword puzzle for a few minutes. Nice. <laughs> it was kind of nice. I, it, it was nice to like be on stage playing a concert, but also be taking a little break. <laughs> <laughs> I think the 2.0 version that, that we're doing tonight with the two pianos is, is maybe less satisfying for us, but more satisfying for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, one of the, the very exciting uh, pieces that's going to be represented tonight is your uh, work, Craigslist Leader, um, which has, of course, got, gotten a lot of attention all over the place because it's a, it's a very, you know, it's, it's approaching a very contemporary topic that is part of everyday life pretty much now. Um, what can you tell us about the inspiration behind that work? You know, um, from the very first time that I was asked that question, I haven't had an answer, which is to say I forget why I wrote it. <laughs> um, what I do remember very specifically is that at the time that I wrote that piece in, in 2006, um, Craigslist was rather prevalent uh, in, in my community. People were finding jobs, apartments, bicycles, basketballs, lovers. Um, all, all via Craigslist. <laughs> and I remember very specifically writing um, an email to my mailing list, which at that point consisted of, I think, seven people, and <laughs> letting them know that, that on such and such date I was going to be premiering Craigslist Leader, and I hadn't written it yet. <laughs> so, so I sort of gave myself a, a shame deadline by, by saying that I was going to write this piece. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, at the time I was interested in, in how public space and private space were shifting, and how voyeurism and exhibitionism in a chaste way were, were kind of shifting. Um, and I think I also found, as I started to, to read Craigslist ads, I found a tr tremendous amount of pathos in a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the piece is performed a lot as much because those texts are really uh, very truthful um, as much as because of the music, and, and that whoever these people were who, who were writing them, more often than not, were really trying to express something, to express some kind of anxiety. 
that feels to me very connected to you know Schumannian or Schumann-esque <laughs> anxiety, and uh, and so I think that the just sort of addressing the universe. Yeah, you know, the ones that are it's something that I believe about comedy, whether it's in theater or in song, is that if if um, the humor stems from pain or some some uh, sort of reaching or aspiration rather than just a punchline, then it, it will probably have a little bit more longevity than mm -hmm. if it's just for shock value or uh, mm -hmm. you know, a punny punchline, yeah. I guess. <laughs> um, for Timo, uh, you have some really awesome song titles. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, such as uh, Piero on 88th Street uh, from, from It Takes a, a Long Time to Become a Good Composer. Uh, <laughs> what, what led to that title for that piece? Um, I'm trying to think of a way to explain this that's not really boring. Um, <laughs> we like boring at the library, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, it takes a long time to be a good composer. Was um, It's a, a suite, a, about a 25-minute piano suite that I wrote to go next to a Schumann suite um, on a concert. And it was really more about... Um, <laughs> more about uh, the duration of Schumann's pieces. Um, so it's a little bit of a double entendre that I in, intentional uh, double entendre, um, which is that people always say like, oh, Schumann was such a great miniaturist, mm -hmm. um, but he couldn't write a real symphony like Beethoven or Brahms. Um, and I, I always just felt that that was a really sort of short-sighted way of, of, um, of judging his music, and uh, decided to, to try and write something in a sort of Schumannian uh, miniature vein. So the two excerpts from that suite, I'm not playing the whole thing. Uh, the two excerpts that I'm playing tonight are the two shortest movements. Um, and the, the Pirot reference is to, um, of course, Schumann's Carnival. It's not really a direct reference to uh, the, the character Pirot. Um, and it's Pirot on 88th Street because at the time I was, I was living in my old piano teacher's house on West 88th Street in New York. Um, and going through her her archive, basically, her, her like music library, um, and kind of making the decisions of, of what was worth keeping and, and what had to go out on the curb for the recycling oh, man. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of disintegrating music from like the 40s <laughs> in there. And it kind of, I put it out in these big bags on the street. and. It was it was fall, and the wind kind of took up some of it, and the, there was music all over the street. Um, <laughs> and so the that little two-minute piece is is kind of these tiny chopped-up fragments of Schumann that are recontextualized and kind of overlaid in um, ways that that Schumann never would have thought of. And um, and then the other one, uh, Please Let Me Sleep, was written just a few weeks later. And I was really sick. I had the flu. Um, and I was all alone in this big house. <laughs> and it was it's just kind of a, a fever dream of some sort, very sort of uh, medicated. <laughs> <laughs> that explains so much. <laughs> I have a question for Gabriel. Um, what, if anything, did you do differently in uh, approaching the composition of February House? I mean, that's theater music versus, um, well, we could sit here and talk for a very long time. <laughs> I, I think, to, to be succinct, the, the question having to do with the difference between writing, say, either a pop song with original lyrics versus writing a theater song with original lyrics, um, not even entering into the question of art songs where you're setting poetry, um, or someone else's text. I think that the, the biggest difference is that you're always serving the moment, the theatrical moment, and also that the lyric has to be comprehended the first time through. Mm -hmm. 
that when, when you're writing lyrics for a pop song, you can be a little bit more obtuse because uh, the assumption is that they're going to be listening to it on a recording and hopefully time and time again, <laughs> trying to parse the, the obscurity of, of your, your prose or your poetry. And uh, you know, on a, on a very mundane level, I would say that I'm, I'm much more prone to pure rhyme in theater songs than I am in my songs that I write mm -hmm. for myself to perform. And that's in part because pure rhyme helps the listener to, to comprehend frequently in the context of, of theater. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's, that's one thing. <clears throat> the other is, is just um, you have to be comfortable in the theater with throwing away a huge amount of material. I wrote, I think, 63 or 65 songs for February House, which has 23 songs in wow. it. Wow. So, and, and some of them, not very a lot of them are terrible, but maybe, <laughs> maybe four or five of them, are, I think, are songs that are as good as any other songs that I've written, the ones that were cut, but didn't serve the moment didn't get from A to B, and so they sit in a drawer, probably for <laughs> <laughs> time immemorial. Yeah. Um, do you have any other productions of it lined up? Not at the moment. Cool. Um, what, uh, what are your sort of thoughts about current commissions that you're working on? Anything that's particularly exciting in terms of the, the performers that you're going to collaborate with? What are you well, well I, I've just finished this piece um, called Gabriel's Guide to the 48 States, all of the texts of which come from uh, federal employees. So, oh, hey. <laughs> um, primarily from the American Guide series published in the 30s mm. uh, under the WPA. And the piece is sort of a tour of the country starting in California and ending up in New York. <clears throat> and it also uh, takes in some other texts, some text by Harry Hopkins from his book Spending to Save, which was a very early account sort of defense of the stimulus in the 30s. Mm. And there's some very beautiful and, and very compassionate writing in there that I've incorporated into the piece. And it's somewhere between a sort of weird like museum history lecture and a song cycle and a theater piece. Um, there are also little fragments from life histories that were recorded also by WPA employees. And I'm going to be doing that with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra on tour. We, our first rehearsal is a week from today. And we're actually coming. No, pretty nearby, we're coming to uh, UMD College Park, mm -hmm. the Clarice Smith Center. Um, so I'm very, very excited, very honored to be working with Orpheus. They're just an extraordinary group and really looking forward to singing and playing with them. Awesome. Well, I'm working at, you know what I'm working <laughs> Yes. Because um, you guys are asking me what the title is. I know, and I still don't know. I notice I didn't say anything yet today. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm mm. finishing up this string quartet that's going to be played here in May. Um, and it's sort of a very compact, intense, uh, it's like a five movement string quartet in the course of 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I, I think it's going to be, uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. This, this quartet, the Ataka Quartet, is, is really hot stuff. Um, Immediately after that, I'm, I'm going to be writing a song cycle, actually, which is something a bit new for me. Um, and it's for three singers, one of whom is sitting right here. <laughs> um, it's actually for three singer composers, interestingly. Along with, so Gabe, along with uh, Ted Hearn and Becca Stevens. Um, it'll be a sort of vocal trio with piano and um, a few other instruments, uh, obligato style. Um, and I, I, that's about all I, all I can say about that project at the moment. Um, Is it going to be hard? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, that's, that's Don't answer question. that question now. <laughs> Think on it. Think on it for a while. I'm not, I'm not going to try to intentionally make it hard, <laughs> if that's, if that's hmm. your worry. Um, I've, done, I've done that in a, in a couple of pieces over the past year, and... Come out, yeah, come out with some some thorny <laughs> stuff, but now this is I, I think going to be a little bit more of a a, a fake folk song vibe. <laughs> Very cool. Um, just a question for Gabe to follow up about your work uh, researching into the WPA and and getting those texts. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience using the library's resources for that? 
<coughs> it's very boring in 2013. The, the most interesting <laughs> part of, of my research was um, collecting first editions of the, the American Guides. I think of the 30 some odd volumes that I have, more than half are first editions mm -hmm. that I was able to get relatively cheaply. Great. I don't think I paid more than 30 bucks. Wow. Um, and they're, they're such beautiful books. I don't know if any of you have seen them, but they, they have these gorgeous maps in the back flap and really beautiful photographs and the typesetting is really lovely. And um, the, the Library of Congress was really useful for me in the, I forget the, the name of the specific archive. Is it the American Memory? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, that the WPA set its employees of the Federal Writers Project to doing when they weren't working on guides was interviewing virtually anyone they could find in, in the hopes of putting together this sort of tapestry that would amount to uh, uh, self-mythology of this country that was sort of exiting adolescence and, and entering a, a very difficult maturity with, with the Depression. And t it's it, extraordinary to me that, that um, the folks who were at the top had, had the foresight to, to do that because what remains is, is this incredible archive that's searchable by any term. Um, there has been uh, quite a bit of, of research demonstrating which now um, canonic writers were at the time young, starving, and unemployed, and, and thus ended up recording these interviews. Like Ralph Allison, um, if you search his name, you can see these, these often very mundane interviews that he recorded with people who he would run into at a bar. Mm. And it's, it's really, really quite beautiful. Um, so, but more or less it consisted of me sitting at home, drinking coffee, typing in words that I was in, you know, I would just sometimes just type in a random, random word um, and let there be the sort of Dada process mm -hmm. because the, the archive is so vast. Um, and one of, one of the movements that I'm most excited about in this piece is called I Boycott the World. And it's an entire interview transcription of a seriously crazy dude um, <laughs> who, who talks about how the poor people will have their cosmic revenge in the end because when the worms come to eat them, there will be so little meat on their bones that they will instead go to the fat cats like J.P. Morgan. Ah. And, and it's, it's so bizarre and very macabre, but I had a really good time doing that awesome. movement. Very cool. Um, well, I think we'll start taking some questions from you wonderful people. Um, if you would just uh, raise your hand and wait for a microphone to come to you so we get it um, properly amplified. Traveling microphone. This is our wonderful microphone guru, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I'm wondering how you uh, got into the concept of the WPA back, back then. Our father planted trees during that time wow. in the little town we grew up in. Um, the, the truth is, it's the, the only time I've ever been commissioned to write a piece on a particular topic. Um, Orpheus, this began three years ago. I interviewed to, to, essentially to write this piece about the WPA. Of course, it ended up not being about the WPA, but sort of of the WPA through, through the text. Um, it happened to coincide with the period that I was working on in February House, which is set just after, um, well, just before we entered the Second World War, 40-41. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of the last four years entrenched in 1934 to 41 or 42. Uh, just kind of a comment, when you introduced the two uh, composer performers, you said that one came from a background of classical towards songwriting or other things, and the other came from songwriting towards classical, and it reminded me, I was just reading description about Gershwin and Leonard Bernstein, mm -hmm. and it was the same. Uh, Gershwin came from jazz to classical and opera, and Bernstein came from classical to... <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so. well, there's a flat comparison. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful story. 
there's a wonderful story about um, Bernstein, a very young Bernstein, um, I think maybe during his time as the assistant uh, conductor of New York Phil. This is in a, a recollection of uh, Charlie Hayden, the great jazz bass player who was playing, I think, with Ornette Coleman uh, at the Village Vanguard. And he had such, Charlie Hayden had such terrible nerves that um, he, he took to always playing with his eyes closed. And one night he was on the bandstand and playing and he opened his eyes and there was this guy on the bandstand with his ear to the <laughs> F hole of the bass. <laughs> and it was Leonard Bernstein. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's very cool. So yeah, he liked jazz. Yeah. Um, I, I heard that you two both got to play on the Gershwin piano. We did. Yeah. Uh, earlier, which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, was what cool. was that experience like? Well, I, on Monday I played Lee Hoiby's piano, so it was a little more exciting than that. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably tell people who Lee Hoiby is, or was, rather. I think he was a good contemporary of Gershwin's, probably. Um, American composer. Opera. Yeah, lots of songs. Um, I was just going <laughs> to... Is this on, actually? Oh, yeah. I was just going to say um, another uh, parallel anecdote about Gershwin, which is that after he'd had so much success with Rhapsody in Blue, um, and he was kind of instantly famous, he did, he, but he, he wanted to sort of work on his composer chops. And so he, he called up... Arnold Schoenberg and, and said, can I study with you? Because Schoenberg was at that time kind of the great, the great master of, of the avant-garde. And um, Schoenberg said something along the lines of, you're a great George Gershwin now, but if you studied with me, you would only be a mediocre Arnold Schoenberg. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the two were, were, of course, tennis partners. And, right, right, right. And this was huge, huge admiration. This was for said one out, of, out yeah, of great out respect, of yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I urge everyone who hasn't seen it yet to check out the Gershwin exhibit uh, before the concert. Um, in there are the, uh, sh the short score of uh, Porgy and Bess in George's hand. Um, American in Paris is there, the, the, the manuscript. Um, George's piano, there are some uh, self-portraits of Ira and George sort of perched opposite uh, of each other on the piano, and some other really amazing artifacts. Um, nice, nice writing desk. Yes, oh, yeah. and George's metronome, if you're into that, and um, Ira's <laughs> fountain pen. Royalty statements for yes. Swanee. <laughs> yes. One of the sort of goofy things that we have in our collections in the music division are business papers related to the, the various special collections that we hold. So. Um, like Serge Kusevitsky, of course, the famed uh, founder of Tanglewood and conductor of the Boston Symphony. Um, I was digging down there one day and came across his phone bill from his estate <laughs> in Tanglewood. It was like totally ridiculous stuff, but uh, very, very cool. And it's, uh, it's a treat for any musician to be around these things, and I'm so happy that they've had a chance to, to see some of our gems today. Um, any other questions? I think we have one right here, Jay. <laughs> I'm wondering whether you are finding more young people coming to your concerts and your uh, times on stage uh, than we do in Washington when we have serious music concerts. It, it really depends on the venue uh, for me. I mean, um, some, some concerts, it's 100% it's, uh, people my age and uh, Others, it's less than that. <laughs> what is your age? Oh. I'm, oh. I'm 27. Never tell. It's in the program. Oh. <laughs> you got official composer dates in here. So. Um, one thing that was very exciting, we had uh, Timo here earlier this season playing with uh, the American Contemporary Music Ensemble mm -hmm. as part of our inaugural uh, late night concert, which we did over the Atlas Performing Arts Center. Um, and we, that concert started at 9.30 p.m. It went on to midnight. There was a cafe table. So it was very, not, not what you usually associate with the Library of Congress, but um, we're, we're trying to be aware of connecting with a lot of younger people. And, and, and there, yeah, really it great. seems like there, uh, there's a great sort of awareness of the need to experiment with these sort of um, logistical things having to do with presenting concerts 
Um, and a, a lot of the presenters that I tend to work with are, you know, trying all sorts of things. And uh, often, often, yeah, it's, it's often something as, as mundane as like changing the start time mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. concert that attracts a different audience. I think, I think also, though, um, Whoa. <laughs> Way to go, Clay. <laughs> um, one, one thing that I've observed a little bit, and I hope this doesn't sound self-congratulatory in terms of this particular program, but the proportion, it isn't that young people don't want to hear dead white guy music, because very, very, often, no, not at all. very often they do, but it's a question of the proportion. And I think on, when, when it's a program that has the sort of obligatory quota of one piece of new music, um, I think it's less, less appealing to young people than when you, you really construct programs that, that are built with, with sort of um, equal attention to the old and the new and, and building a bridge between the two. And, and my experience has been that those kinds of concerts that I attend um, or perform are, are the ones that have a much more diverse audience than, than those um, where you know, I'm, I'm the token new music concerto well, yeah, artist. There, and, there was, a, for a long time, kind of this idea that, um, that, it was that like you broccoli. Had, yeah, that you had to take your new music medicine. <laughs> no. um, and that's just like you're, you're just starting out behind, and you fall even further behind when that's the case. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think there is a great deal of enthusiasm for discovering new work. And, and also, I mean, one thing I like to do in, in my solo concerts is kind of present the old through the lens of the new. So it ki I'll kind of reverse the proportions of those concerts and play a, a kind of all last 10 years program and throw on a little Brahms and Schumann kind of interspersed. <laughs> and I, I always feel like that is, is kind of, it's a, it's a way to see something that you don't usually see in that music. Yeah, I was, gonna, music. I was going to compliment your programming before you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, something I've always enjoyed about your solo concerts is, is the way that the, the standard repertoire that you program really feels reframed by everything that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's in part what we're interested in trying to do with this concert. Right, and I, I, I mean, I think that's what you have to do when, when presenting any sort of older art is kind of ask yourself, like, how does this relate to what I'm doing now and what mm -hmm. people are doing now and kind of how the world is? Um, you, can't, you can't just say, Oh well, I wish we were in the golden era. Um, so I'll I'll do what I can to right, try and right. create a facsimile of that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, yes. Um, hello, um, I'm Sam Wilson. I'm a student over at the Duke Ellington High School here in DC. I was just wondering, what were some of your um, contemporary influences? Oh gosh, I mean, it's, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I guess one of the one of the first um, one of the first living composers I really fell in love with was John Adams. And that was when I was a, uh, just, just when I started college. Um, before that, it, I mostly, it had mostly been uh, um, kind of mid-century contemporary composers. Um, but yeah, when I, I discovered John's music, actually when someone hired me to play one of his pieces with them and, um, uh, it just kind of threw me for a loop. I didn't know, no, no pun intended. Um, I, I didn't quite understand if it was really interesting or really boring. Um, and, and sort of with the repetition, because I, I, I had to keep on coming back to it because I had to learn it. Um, and I think that was sort of the key. That's actually often the key for me when, I, when I'm discovering new work is 
some, I'll, I'll have to just learn something. <laughs> and uh, so soon after that, um, I, I got very into Ligeti, who was then alive. Um, so I think that counts. Um, let's see, uh, Thomas Addis is one of my favorite living composers. Um, you know, I, I take a great deal of um, inspiration and, and advice from just sort of my contemporaries who I, who I um, were like Gabe and, and so many others who live nearby and, who, uh, and, and we do work together. So, yeah, all over. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the question about, about influences is, is always a, a, a tricky one, and, and not because we, we want to pull the wool over the eyes of, of an audience and, and imagine that what we're doing comes from nowhere. <laughs> and and on, you know, on the contrary, I think for me, all art, whether it's music or literature or painting, is about intertextuality or conversation between what's happening now and what happened in some other time. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, everything is an influence. And you, yeah. you sort of pick and choose the things that you're responding to. Um, I, I happen to love all the composers that, that Timo mentioned. But I sort of think maybe, I think probably we both think less in terms of um, what is influencing the sound uh, of what has been written. It's true, and, and I just listed like a bunch of uh, very specific, <laughs> like notated orchestral music composers. Right. Um, and if you wanted to go beyond that, it would be a long evening. And we would but... talk about literature, and we would talk about you know, the graphic arts, and we would talk about food, and all of these things that, no, but truly, all these things that come to bear, I think, on how we make music. Mm -hmm. And just you know, music of the non-notated variety. Right. Um, to begin with, I mean, uh, I actually I made a, a very conscious decision at a certain point, um, right around that same time when I was a, starting college, that I would make myself open to all influences, sort of no matter where they were coming from, and that I, I, I kind of made a resolution for myself not to, not to prejudge a work of art based on the sort of non-art trappings of it, if you know what I mean. Um, and I, th I think I've stuck to that resolution pretty well. And I think it's been a, it's a, it's a, been a good thing for me, and I, I definitely recommend it to anyone who wants to try. Well, I think that's why your, your music comes off as it's like a, an omnivore. If, you're, if your music has a Mm -hmm. has a way of eating, it's omnivorous. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's why, um, like I, we were just discussing this on the train on the way here, is like why composers kind of hate it when a writer or a critic will put some sort of label on them that they never knew that they were <laughs> like, with, yeah. yeah, like minimalist or neo-romantic neo or <laughs> indie classical. It's like, wait, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, I think in, you know, in the case of, of classical music, there have been certain oppressive tendencies in the concert hall that have made people, made concert goers feel like they don't have the tools to judge the music. And I remember a very specific moment when I understood what it was like for people who don't grow up who didn't grow up you know, with a concert pianist for a father. When I, I went to see a modern dance piece when I first moved to New York, and I was doing some work with, with dancers, and, and a friend of mine was dancing, and he said afterward, what, you know, what do you think, what did you think? And I said, oh, I don't know, I, don't, I mean, I don't know anything about dance, but, and he, he said, you know, that apology is not useful. You, you respond however you respond, and it doesn't matter what you know. It's so and, common, though, to and, hear that. And I think that in, in concert music, very often these labels are put on things to sort of tell people how to respond, when what we really want is for you to just you know, open your ear and your heart and feel it. <laughs> it's a little more work, but I think it's, <laughs> I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. Great. And uh, I think on that note, uh, we're going to 
shift over for the evening and uh, certainly welcome you into the Coolidge Auditorium later and um, hope that you feel that you're an integral part of this experience because for any performer, um, yes, we perform for ourselves in a certain extent, but it's really to share the music making with you and um, the energy that's in a room can make or break and totally shape a performance. So we really appreciate your being here. We appreciate your time uh, with, with chatting with uh, Gabe and Timo. And we appreciate your time, of course, to sharing your thoughts with us. And um, we will let them have a little bit of a break. <laughs> and you'll see them at 8 o'clock. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.